me agreeing that men benefit more is just not something that I read. It's something that I know. Um, and I think oftentimes when men, most men first read that statement, they're thinking about the divorce aspect. The woman benefits at the divorce. Well, one, we're not talking about divorce. We're not even putting that in the atmosphere. It's, we're talking about the entry. What's up, Brave Hearts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of It's Scary to Be Mary Wanting You to Love Fearlessly. I have a special guest in the house with us today. She is a returning guest, one of my favorite people. Uh, if you missed that episode, we talked about thirst trapping and man shaming. It was really, really good. It's probably about a year ago. So make sure that you go check that out. Hit the subscribe button. And the video might pop up in your feed, but just go check it out. She is a mother of five. She's a techie. She's an admin over a large Facebook group, Toss Only. And I will, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> and she's coming out with a book called Thank You Notes, which I'm excited about. I want to uh, talk about that as well. Bravehearts community, let's show some love to Autumn Sonata. How are you doing this lovely okay. Saturday morning? am amazing. I feel good. Ready to talk about this hot topic. And um, yeah, it, it caused some some chaos on social media. So I, I'm excited about it. Thank you for having me again. No, for sure. And today's topic is do men, uh, well, men, this is my stance because I, I talked about this on Twitter. And of course, I do a lot of research and stuff like that. So I'm not just talking out of my rear end. <laughs> uh, men benefit more in marriage than women. Now, I know that because I in the comment section, there were some things that people were saying like, yeah, they both benefit and stuff like that. I get it. But I mean, let's be honest. I'm going to talk about this even in my personal life as well. Men just benefit more. Uh, Autumn, what are your take on this? So the first question I have is actually for you. Okay. Because um, when I first saw the topic, my the question was in my mind what is the motivation behind that statement so posting it on social media of course you're going to get everybody's lived experience but what was your motivation behind that statement was it to and i know you're not a promoter of division but was it to strike a chord or was it to drive understanding or like like that match and have people asking questions in and getting an answer to, you know, bridge that divide between uh, men and women. So what was your driver? It, it came from a place of my own personal life. And of course, through research from what I've done before. And mm -hmm. just to give a short answer, my wife is the point guard of our, of our home. Like she's the point guard. Mm -hmm. Now, there are things that when you see a lot of things happen in your household, you think it just runs smoothly. But there's planning that goes on behind the scenes that I think most women who are the point guards of their home. And when I say that, you know, to all my basketball people out there, <clears throat> they understand that there's a certain thing that goes on behind the scene where you're doing the planning. You're doing you're setting doctor's appointments. You especially if you have kids, you're mm -hmm. prepping for meals, all these different things. But on the outside looking in, you just see it happen. And that's not saying that I don't do my job as a man, but I work 14, 15 hours a day. So a lot of times she has the house running smoothly. Even when we go on vacations and trips, she booked she booked the room. She gets the spots for us where we go get um, um, where we go and, you know, just do different things together. So she does all that behind the scenes. But when you see it, it just looks so smooth and you think it's something we done together. She just kind of give me the updates. Yeah, yeah. And I pretty much kind of fall in line. So that's where it came from, if that answers your question. Okay. Because I, I before I reposted it, my concern was that people would read it and instantly go into defense mode, mm -hmm. especially our, our men. And for good reasons. But um, for me, it's important. It was important to note that my stance comes from um, a position where there are two healthy people entering a marriage, where there are two, you know, two people who have the same end goal, who 
who have the same willingness and understanding of what this is going to be, whatever that dynamic looks like to them. And I think in either case, whether the woman is a breadwinner or the man is a breadwinner, when we're, when we're eliminating finances, it still comes out that the man benefits more. And this is not only my lived experience, but through research, having five children, having been married twice, um, I can only speak for myself when I say I'm not the type of woman who wants to just sit down and lay on her back. So when it comes to being active, when it comes to contributing financially, whether it's the bulk of the finances or a portion of it, when it comes to rearing the children, when it comes to the minor things, well, they're not even minor, but the things that make everyone else's lives easier, that's the burden of the woman. And on top of that, making sure that we compliment our men in the way that those visual creatures, you visual creatures are, <laughs> keeping ourselves up. That entails making sure we make our own appointments on time, making sure we are mentally stable, physically fit, healthy, and that we bring joy and peace into not only our men's lives, but our children's lives, if that's the case. So that takes a lot out of us. And nowadays, a woman just can't stay home. Most of us can't. So we have to be out working and then come home and still take care of our men and our children in the household and then, you know, maintaining um, our social status and things of that nature, because that is our burden as well. So um, me agreeing that men benefit more is just not something that I read. It's something that I know. Um, and I think oftentimes when men, most men first read that statement, they're thinking about the divorce aspect. The woman benefits at the divorce. Well, one, we're not talking about divorce. We're not even putting that in the atmosphere. It's, we're talking about the entry when we're coming out the blocks into marriage. We're talking about the beginning. The Bible, for those who believe in the word, the Bible says the man who finds a wife finds a good thing. What is that good thing if it's not a benefit? A benefit is a good thing. Yeah. It's plain and simple for me. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of us look at our lived experience and look at the end result and say, yeah, that wasn't, I didn't benefit from that. The man says, I didn't benefit from that. She took half or she took this. In actuality, women who get divorced end up worse off financially in the beginning than they were when they were married, unless they married a billionaire and, you know, whatever that end case is. But most of the time, the woman has the children. She has to, to take care of all of the responsibilities by herself then, including financial, including the, the emotional and the mental aspect of it. So negating the end part, because we're not talking about the end, we're focusing on the beginning, the man benefits more. And we haven't even went into the reasons why. We haven't even went into the health, into the social status. We haven't even went into all of that. His physical being, being you, we promote women influence and promote that. Babe, get up and go do this. Let's go do this together. We haven't talked about the soft space that we provide for you to unload the things that you can't tell to your homeboys because you'll be judged for them. We haven't talked about the receptacles we become for our men because we want to promote and support them. So I'm gonna stop because it's it's a lot. <laughs> no, no, this is good because you're hitting on all cylinders. I, I totally agree with everything you're saying because one of the things I looked at for my household, because if you don't know, I have, well, I have four kids total. Three of them are with us. Mm -hmm. Two of them are two together has autism. Mm. So that's that's another area that we haven't even touched on the things that it takes just to get them to uh, ABA therapy, to get them to appointments, mm. surgeries, uh, so many different things to accommodate for kids having autism. Mm. So that's another a realm within itself on top of, like you say, social status, taking care of yourself, getting your hair done, getting your nails done. There's when I get home from work, I make sure that my wife gets her time to herself because she's been with kids all day on top of working, all the, on top of working. Right. So <laughs> and, and granted, they're in therapy for the most part of the day. And my other son, he's in school. So but she works from home. Hmm. But on top of that, I'm like, look, get some time to yourself. Even if you need a girl's trip, you need a weekend to yourself to get away. I try to make sure that she's good on her own because I understand how much. Well, maybe I don't understand 
mm-hmm. how much of a burden you all carry to make that happen. <laughs> and I want to speak to you about in your marriage, in your first two marriages, like how how did you play? How did that play into your marriage? Did you find yourself being the one who were maybe giving more giving to make sure that he was good? Like how how did that work? Did it work in both marriages where you were the and I'm throwing on my air quotes, the point guard of your family? So in my first marriage, I married really young. Well, we got together really young. We were 19. Well, I was 19. Mm-hmm. Had a whole bunch of babies. Um, and we did not vet each other properly. It was, it was, it was a trial and error. Um, I was a breadwinner for most of our togetherness. Um, he, he, he had an alternative job. So <laughs> in a volatile position. Um, but on top of being the one who was allocated to, or who had allocated myself to, you know, perform those, that nine to five duty, um, I was having babies. I was pregnant. I was taking care of newborns. Um, and he was home, you know, doing his part with, with the children or with our child at the time. But as a mom, when you ha- when you have a child and go back to work six weeks after, you're still at home. Like you're still thinking about your child. That mental bandwidth is allocated towards your newborn and your family and the household. So being at work and, and trying to juggle, you know, those duties and my mind being, you know, um, occupied, you know, by my child was a stressor in itself. And then coming home and trying to still play point guards, trying to stay in my lane, because this is the lane I was raised to be in. Um, but the frustration and jumping between masculine and feminine was just very, very trying. And um, that was a burden that I was not built to bear. That was one that I, I had to learn how to um, how to navigate through trial and error through those you know through that experience, and it's a lesson that I'm glad I learned early on. Um, but it was hard; it was definitely hard. And as a woman, I always wanted to present myself as his partner, so it was always you know put his ego and in our union or the 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 picture of it out front. And then we deal with the struggles at home. But when you don't have the coach there or when he's not, he's not willing to coach and you're actually the coach and the player and the, the one coming off the bench and the water boy, <laughs> it's like, I can't hold it up all by myself and carry a baby on my, on my waist in a diaper bag in my arm. Like I need help. So, you know, we often struggle and that's one of the other benefits that studies have shown that men have, they don't have those, they don't suffer as much as women do with conflict. When men are the dominant ones in the relationship, women, we oftentimes submit to their leadership and sometimes that conflict is burdensome. So we bear that on the outside, but we we have to look like we have it all together. So, um. That was one of my major struggles. And that's one that I am glad that I went, I experienced that because now I have my daughter that I can teach, you know, how to navigate that if she ever finds herself in that position. But yeah, that's one of the major struggles that I dealt with as a woman in my first marriage. Mm, yeah, that's that's a lot. And, and, the, and, and I wanted to have conversations about this, healthy conversations, because it, it wasn't a point to divide. It was, let's talk about it. Because I think, and as a man, I hold other men accountable because I'm like, if you are the leader of your home, change starts with you. That's not saying that a woman shouldn't be accountable. And I think we 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 put up these defense mechanisms when someone strikes a chord with us, we automatically go into trauma mode. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. well, when I was 25 and I got divorced, my wife took everything from me. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how. And we make this better where she benefit as well. Mm-hmm. Because like you said before, and I read, I read in the comment section, one guy was talking about divorce and I'm like, we're not talking about divorce. Where are you getting that from, sir? <laughs> and like you said, people speak from their pain. So when they hear something that's triggering, it automatically goes into, they're talking about me. No, there's a bigger picture than just you. And there are people who don't know what women deal with or don't know what men deal with. 
And so these types of conversations are necessary because it brings an awareness. And I think, you know, like you were saying before, it's important to um, acknowledge that this is not in purpose to divide, but to bring understanding. Because I, I saw a couple of comments where people were like, you know, um, why are we, you know, promoting the the gender divide and these gender wars? And it's like, if you really step outside of your perspective and look at the bigger picture, which is us, the collective, there is a knowledge gap there and something that is lacking that can be, you know, what, how, you know, how close we bring that together, I don't know. But if we can move baby steps one inch at a time, then we could get there. We can all just step outside of ourselves and come to this understanding and sit at the table and talk. It's very simple, but we make it difficult because we want to be right instead of be together. So I'm thankful for this conversation. Yeah. Um, no, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say in my second marriage, totally different dynamic. He was the leader in what I thought what a leader should be. The one who provided financially, um, did his nine to five and came home and was just like, you know, the boss of the house. So when he came home, I could take a break because I knew that he was there to facilitate things while I relaxed and he was well respected. So that was, you know, uh, a major part in that relief in my second marriage. But when we're talking about marriage and purpose and health, a lot of times we forget to consider emotional and mental health. Um, you can have all the money in the world. You can have the most beautiful, submissive, you know, wife. But I've seen some of the, the wealthiest people be the most unhappiest in their marriage. Because sometimes along with money comes that the ego is inflated or the uh, this, this facade that you're better than a superiority complex comes. And again, women suffering in silence from the conflict that happens behind closed doors because she's at home and he's making all the money and those different things. So um, it's important to consider mental health too, because that's a whole nother uh, benefit that men get when they are married. They don't have to worry about too much. They go out in the world and that's, en that's enough stress on them already going out in the world, but coming home to peace, that's a mental benefit that they are allotted when they get married. They know they're coming home to sex, to food, to, to joy, to happiness. And that gives them the strength to go back out in the world and do their thing. That's another benefit. And I think oftentimes that's looked over. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with everything you're saying because we do get that peace when <laughs> when we come home. And even still, because I have little ones, the eight, eight, four, and three, little, right? There's still a certain amount of peace that I get when I come home. Even even finding this time autumn to record this, <laughs> right? Yeah. You don't hear any kids. Yeah. That's because my wife has a lot of time for me. To make this happen. So that's just a small little way I'm, I'm benefiting now. Have mm -hmm. almost 500 videos on YouTube. Wow. 500 videos. So that means I'm, that means my wife has a lot of space for me that she believes in the vision and has given me this time. I'm benefiting from that. Uh, I was doing some research that one of the reasons men feel that they don't benefit is because they feel like they're going to have their, uh, freedom taken away or they feel like they're going to be controlled because now I'm a husband. If I'm a boyfriend, I can kind of vacillate between being, you know, your man and, and still with my homeboys, that kind of thing. But when I'm married, it's all of a sudden it's, I'm the provider. I'm the protector. It's almost as if I can't have any fun now because I'm married. So a lot of guys shy away from that and they get the benefits of marriage without actually getting married. So, you know, you know how that story goes, right? Yeah. First, I want to say, yeah, having your wife take care of the kids while you're doing this is a benefit because right now I'm living on hope and a prayer that <laughs> one of my kids don't walk up in here asking me for a snack that they absolutely do not need. And I've warned them. I work from home, so they know when the doors close, don't bother me. But it doesn't it doesn't get through. It's just for some reason it doesn't translate we're still working on that so that's a benefit for you um oh god <laughs> but yeah um as far as the control i understand that 
I understand that completely. And again, that goes back to two healthy individuals coming together with this, with the same understanding that we are united as one in purpose and in love. I am still an individual. I do things out of respect for you now because you're my husband or wife and you do things out of, that's, that's the understanding that we have, but I am still going to have my green nails. I'm still going to do brunch with the girls. I'm still going to do my vacay, solo vacay every year. And these are things that you get to know about one another in the dating stage. So you can under, you, you'll be able to, to know that this is the person for you and that you're compatible. Um, but when you jump into something without vetting that person, of course, you're going to have those issues because they're still an individual. Um, but it's, and I hear a lot of men saying, you know, after you get married, the sex is gone. Well, maybe if y'all talk and understand each other's sex languages and speak to that unselfishly, then that wouldn't be an issue. I never had that issue because being a vocal person, this is what I like. This is what I know that you like. And when we're going to, we're going to talk about it and make sure that we're both pleased and being married actually is a orgasmic experience because you have a partner that you can do any and everything with and explore. So it should be a level up in sex, not a level down. So that, you know, that's very telling when I hear men say that too, or who are you choosing, sir? Like do better. <laughs> do better. <laughs> Exactly. And I'm glad that you brought up the whole sex thing because men feel like they lose out sexually. And and this is another topic. I'm not going to go too far into this because I don't want to start anything. <laughs> but I tell men a lot of times, you got to have self-control before you say I do. If you if if you if you are running through women like Lord knows. Just because you, and I tweeted this the other day, just because you get a wedding ring doesn't give you superpowers. Right. If you used to doing that and you think that this one woman is going to please you because you you think you think that you're good now that you finished sowing your royal oaths, that one woman just will not be enough for you because you haven't trained yourself to, to have to master temptation. Now, don't get me wrong. You always have fine women out here. It's going to be some baddies. That's just going to be the territory. But if you haven't trained yourself, you're going to fall. Yeah. I'm just saying. So I'm glad you brought that up. And that that's another um, aspect of, of marrying on purpose. Um, I've heard, I heard someone say a few times, uh, you're already a wife before you become a wife. Like when you're intentional, when you're when you're growing, when you are um, preparing yourself for a partnership, you're already in that mindset. He who finds a wife, not he who finds a woman, then turns her into a wife. He who finds a wife means she is already in that mindset, meaning that she is already prepared to serve and be served to. She already understands servant leadership and submission, whatever that means to you. Um, but she's already geared and prepared for the purpose of companionship, not in the mindset to sabotage because she's looking for the next best thing. I've been there, um, not for the purpose. Can you talk about that, please? And have a wedding. Um, so, yeah, this is a whole nother show because <laughs> I'm, I'm still single. I'm pending marriage. Let's just say that, we'll that into that for, for the third time. Third time's a child. We ain't going to talk about that. Right. But, um, sabotaging your relationships. I've done that before. I've been single for almost six years now. I've been dating for four. And when I first got back onto the dating scene, it was so overwhelming that I did not know how to navigate. I did not know how to say no to everybody. So I just shut down and, and just said, I'm not doing this. This is not for me. Um, but when I started dating intentionally, I thought I was ready then. So I'm like, I'm gonna give this person a chance. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna move my traumas aside and date with a clear mind. And I started dating a guy and he was amazing, amazing guy. When we started talking about commitment, I froze. I was like, oh my God, what does this mean? Like, who? I don't, I'm scared. Like I am terrified of being in another relationship. And I don't know how to tell this wonderful person that I am flawed. So um, I started looking for things to be wrong. 
Like, how is he in the morning when he wakes up? Is he going to want sex every single morning? Like, even after I take the kids to school, all this stuff. And if I don't say, is he going to belittle me? My trauma started coming out. Like, when you get into a relationship, it exposes everything about you. And you have to be aware of those things, the good and the bad. I started sabotaging every single thing about the connection. If he didn't call me on a certain time, oh, is he with somebody else? Because I was cheated on before. Um, if he expected me to be on time, when I said I was going to be on time, I was, is he manipulating me? Is he a narcissist? I was like, what, what kind of stories are you making up in your head about this man who was just amazing two weeks ago? So, um, I totally blew that relationship. I blew it. And I went back to him and I apologized because I recognized what I was doing. Um, and then, you know, taking mental notes of my actions and my thoughts in dating moving forward uh, really helped me, you know, relieve that trauma and um, take action on it before, you know, it surfaced um, in the relationship. So now I'm at a point where I'm very patient and intentional about who I date. And there's no longer bitterness or trauma behind my no. My no's are sure. My no's are quick and they're permanent. <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's been a different thing. It's absolutely fun getting to know people. And um, I think when you have learned your lessons and moved through stuff, um, you, you can love more freely and often. Um, and it's actually an enjoyable time so that I know that when my Boaz uh, comes, if he's not already around, um, it's, it's going to be a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, I, and I hear the confidence. Oh, yeah. I hear the confidence. So, <laughs> put it out. yeah, you got to put it out there. And like you, you like you made a reference to the scripture that he who finds a wife. Right. Mm -hmm. And the B clause of that is and he obtains favor from the Lord, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and during my Bible study, not to get too spiritual, but I was in my Bible study the other day. And oh, I recognized this years ago, but it was just refreshing to hear it again. That wisdom in the Bible is in reference to a woman. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I just thought that that was very interesting. It's she, you know, mm. she calls out in the street wisdom, that whole thing. So I think that's very important because there are a lot of women that's very wise in that whole intuition thing. And, you know, so uh, I think sometimes as men, we don't value that enough. And a woman, when you spoke about uh, your trauma speaking, you know, because a lot of times we do when we're dealing with things and we're triggered. I learned about this just real quick. I'm because uh, my wife and I were taking a marriage class, and this has been groundbreaking for us. This understanding your pain cycles, mm. and it says when I'm in conflict or argue with my spouse, I generally feel. And they give you this list of unsafe, insecure, powerless, unknown, disconnected, vulnerable, controlled. So when you have these, when you feel these kind of things, it comes from a place of hurt from before you got married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is childhood stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So we, if we don't deal with those things, they're going to show up regardless of whoever we're with. Yeah. Yeah, there's this book that I read. I reference it all the time. It's called Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. Yep. Our bodies hold all of that stuff from childhood moving forward. People, um, if they don't take notice of how their bodies respond to certain triggers, they would think that, oh, it's just the weather. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling well because it's this time of year or maybe it's something I ate. Our stomach is our second brain our bodies are so powerful everything around us the synergy the the frequency all that is centered around our body and how we think and how we move and how we remember things um traumas it's trapped in our bodies people have all these these diseases diseases mm -hmm. that are nurtured through our these lessons and these these lived experiences, and we hold on to them and carry them out through actions uh, um, when we're triggered. I remembered um, my husband, my first husband. Um, I had a lot of trauma as a child with domestic violence and stuff, 
And I took that into my marriage. Um, and in my mind and in my heart, I wanted to be the woman who didn't want to fight. I wanted to be the woman who served and loved on and gave to my husband. So we wouldn't, I would, I didn't want to have any conflict. I, I ran away from arguments because I did not want to repeat that cycle. So I'm like, I want to avoid all of that by just being quiet, not being myself. I was shutting down for the purpose of a good marriage. He came into the relationship with his trauma. He was abandoned as a child. So when he saw conflict, he would run. And running to me looked like abandonment or it looked like abuse. And when I saw that, my, my desired response was to dwindle down and to be submissive so he would, he would come back and love me. But my reaction was, I'm going to get you before you get me. So before you run, I'm going to run. And if you, if you in any way raised your voice or exhibited aggression towards me, I'm going to fight. My body said fight because that's what I saw, but my heart wanted to dwindle. So we went through that struggle with how do we react to this? How do we maintain self-respect and how do we protect ourselves or um, give voice to the child that we didn't have, the voice that we didn't have when we were younger? How are we protecting our child self now? In front of kids, in front of family and friends, we were still fighting as children. And it was a volatile situation. Thank God we are friends and love each other now. Um, even though he's remarried and he knows there is no issue because we both had to come to the conclusion that we were fighting out of trauma and the friendship should have been prioritized. And um, that's what we have been doing for the last few years. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that dog on trauma boy that'll come up in and every time if you don't address it and there's always going to be somebody in a relationship that's going to bring it out of you but you have to be strong enough to say this is not them this is me and deal with it for yourself so yes you have to recognize you have to recognize because if like you say if they triggered you it wasn't on them it's you it's it's it to be something to trigger yeah. yeah it's it's internal and then also what are your coping mechanisms mm -hmm. If you don't understand your coping mechanisms, you're going to continually have this dance. I always talk about the dance that you you're always going to have these same conversations, these same arguments, because she's used to you acting a certain way when she says something and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it's the dance. So somebody has to make the change. Yeah. And then you're going to dance differently because someone chose to be proactive, because a lot of times I hear people in coaching sessions, they telling me. And, you know, uh, I can't change people. No, you can't. You can change you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah. you can't change them. And then I think about getting a T-shirt made called Change Starts With Me, mm -hmm. because that's the only way you're going to make the change. And it's going to do one of two things to that person. Either it's going to push them further away because they aren't used to the change or either it's going to end up forcing them to change eventually because they're like, you're on a different level mm -hmm. and I want to get there, too. Yeah. And that trust is a major factor too. Um, in this healed state, and healing is a constant um, journey, but in this state that I'm in now, my ability to detach from a person is so strong and lovingly so. Um, oftentimes people hear the word detachment, they think that, you know, it's dismissiveness or, or, um, or the in, inability to relate. I forget what the word for that is. Mm -hmm. But detachment in a spiritual sense is understanding and knowing that I am my own person, that you are your own person. I trust you to be who you show me that you are. And this thing, nothing is forever. And being appreciative of the connection as it is, when it is, how it is, is what gratitude it, it is so, it is so fruitful mm -hmm. being gracious and, and grateful for what is not what I want it to be, not what I'm going to try to change it into, but what it is and understanding that if that does not serve my purpose, our purpose, or speak to my core values, then it is okay. And it is better to let that person be, let it go. 
let them, it's better for them. It's better for you. It is, it is honest to let that person go. But, but why do you feel that so many people struggle in that area? Because a lot of times people see the red flags, but they still continue to think that they could possibly change this person. I think, um, we are born, like we are bred to be selfish. We are bred to believe that who we're with is who we're supposed to be. That's our person. My husband, my significant is my person. The only person that is yours is you. You are for you. From the from day one, you are for you. Your parents may try to teach you to be a certain way, but in your authenticity tells you that you are for you. You are a unique individual. This whole other being that you're connected for, for however long is that person and whatever their experience is. Be grateful for the moments that you have together. And then when it's time for them to go, graciously let them go. Say thank you. And I always say, when love leaves, if it leaves, let it leave and ask you to leave the door open because someone else is coming along. But this ownership thing that we got going on is the most complete, it's uh, so selfish because we want what we want for that person. We don't want what they want. We want what we want. So we grab a hold on to that and, and justify it by saying we're married or we're together and you are my person. No, honey, y'all didn't come into this world together. That's, right. that's somebody, that's, that's a whole nother being. They're responsible for them. I, yeah, I think it's rooted in selfishness. Yeah. That is so good. Yeah, because I tell people that help your significant other or your spouse to become who they want to become, not who you want them to become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it took me years to learn that in my first marriage, because you know, this is my second marriage. So I had to learn over time that I can't change my wife, my ex-wife. You know, I was just trying to make her into a mini me, trying to make her into one of my minions. It's just like, no, you can't do that. And this time around, I was like, I'm not making that mistake again. I'm going to love you for your individuality. And, and because we think different, that's all good. Because I'm like, I can't do it. it. It just takes too much of your mental bandwidth to try to change somebody. And some people are controlling, so it might be a little easier. But I'm I'm not a fan. Uh, statistically, I want to actually, I'm going to talk to you about this. Men remarry faster than women. I know I did. My ex-wife didn't remarry. I remarried. Mm -hmm. Men remarry faster. Statistically, it shows that women are more, they're like, nah, I'm cool on the second marriage stuff because they understand what comes with a marriage. Mm -hmm. And I think men might not get it as, as much as, as women do. So let me ask you this. If if women know that benefit, if 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 women know that men benefit more from marriage, like why getting why remarry? Well, my second marriage, I had no idea. All I know is that I was used to working and I was tired. Mm -hmm. And this guy came on like right afterwards. It's like, I got you. We on, we met by, we met on Facebook. He was going to help me build my son a computer for Christmas. And I was like, oh, that is so cool. He is so attractive because he can build this computer and I'm in the tech and I don't have, I don't have to do it on my own. I don't have to figure it out. He's like, I'll go to micro center and get it for you. Just. I was like, acts of acts of service. You want to do this for me? You want to help me? And you don't want to charge me that much for it? I was like, oh, that that was so freaking attractive to me. Didn't know what he looked like. Like I had never met him. Um, and then when I met him, I was like, oh, snap. He is handsome. Like, <laughs> I was like, he didn't me smart. That's all I need. Like, <laughs> I don't need nothing else. That's all I need is looks and, and intelligence. Mm -hmm. My core values are honesty, creativity, and humility. Didn't consider none of that. <laughs> All that was out the window. <laughs> so um, we got together and just my love language was being spoken to so heavily. The touch there, the quality time, the acts of service all there. And then he started giving gifts. I'm like, oh shit, like somebody's going to give me a gift. This is a fourth one. I don't know yours. So I was, I was blown out the water. We got married quick. So I'm like, I'm locking this down. This is my person. I own him. You know, we, we got married and boy, oh boy. I was like, what the hell just happened? 
didn't consider mental health, didn't consider past. We didn't talk about the past. We didn't talk about our past relationships. Well, we did, but I talked about the negative experience that I had just gotten out of. It was all negative. So he came in with the, the mindset that I am her hero because I rescued her from that situation. I did not consider anything about his past, family, stand, anything, all that came out in the marriage. And um, we were married for a good four months before I filed for a divorce and new baby and everything. And it was just that pressing for me to leave five kids in tow. Like, this is not it. Um, so, you know, my, in that second marriage, I did not understand what benefits I allotted my first husband. I was just looking for a relief. Um, I did not understand my own worth. I did not understand what I brought or brought to the table, which I, men don't ever ask a woman that question. Mm -hmm, yeah. Not, not a woman who's on nine or 10 level with her life and her, her, don't do that. You will lose every time. Um, but I didn't understand it. After my second divorce, after those two years I started dating and growing and healing, I understood my value in a marriage. And I understood what I brought to the connection. I under, I became happy in being single. And um, it brought such an awareness to my life that I wasn't thirsty for connection and marriage anymore. I was like, oh shit, it's, it feels good here. Like, I don't, I ain't got to take care of a man right now. I got to, I can go out, have fun with my girls. And not to say that, and I, I said, I know this in a study, it said that women um, are happiest when they are single or, or you know, um, not married. It's not that we are happier single, it's that we can be happier single than men can be happier single. We have the emotional support. We have, you know, the um those relationships with our with our homegirls, with family members who who offer those safe spaces for us. We're more social creatures. So when we go out to brunch, we're talking about our stressors. We have therapy sessions any day, all day. I understand that men don't have that. We have touch, we hug each other, we console each other. We seek out the resources to take care of ourselves. Self-care Saturday just ain't a, in a trend. We do that, like heavy. We hug on our children. We, we have those things that we need from outside resources, whereas men, they kind of suffer because, you know, to hug another man is taboo, I guess, you know, and seek out the help is taboo. So when we get into a marriage, we're giving those things up and we're sharing those things, whereas men are receiving that. And so, um, so also be clear and to speak, you know, from the, for the benefit of that men bring to relationship, while we do receive that support and that love and all those things, we need the man. And I'll say this all day, every day, I am happy single, but I am damn sure ready to be in a relationship <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I don't want to date no more, Lord. I'm, <laughs> there's, there's too many of y'all. I thought having five kids would kind of, you know, narrow my pool down. No, shit is wide open. I'm like, Boaz, come get me. Like, I'm sick of this. Like, I want to wake up and be hugged and touched and loved on and loved on my person that, well, my, my, my husband, you know, um, we're not, we need each other. And that's my, that's my, my point. Thank you. Whether woman is bringing more emotionally, mentally, um, you know, spiritually, and whether men is bringing financially, it's all to the bigger purpose. We need one another. So, yes. Um, Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you said that because we we do need each other. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. I always tell people God made us interdependent, not independent. Mm -hmm. you know, we just because because for me because how we married, I, I met my wife on Instagram. And we married six months after we met. And we dated long distance, Autumn. Oh, shit. <laughs> we dated long distance. I proposed after 90 days. Wow. Yeah. And 
it, it can happen, you know, and that's not saying that my wife and I don't have issues and hangups because Lord knows we'd be going to town sometimes. But I've realized that us having our individual therapist and a marriage therapist we see together makes our bond that much stronger because we can deal with our personal issues with our individual therapist. And then we in our marriage therapy is like, oh, this is us as a unit. Yeah. You know, so we married and um and I didn't relocate until almost a year later. Okay. So it was just like this time, this waiting time and trying to get everything together for me to make this move. So you're talking about getting to know someone when you're actually under one roof after dating long distance. Oh, and yeah. you know, so it, it was it was a lot, but Five years in, I'm glad that we're in the place that we're in now, because I tell people sometimes conflict is necessary. It helps grow that muscle. Yes. Yeah. Conflict resolution. That's another thing that you have to talk about when dating. How do you resolve conflict? I'm very much a heads on person. Like, tell me and be completely open and expressive with how you feel. Mm-hmm. We'll do that. Now, if that's not your thing and um the, you know, we're both speaking to the purpose of the relationship. If you need your space, then I respect that. But we have to communicate that. I think that, you know, at this time in my life, um, 90 days and proposing is not something that's just, you know, outlandish to me. I feel like when you have the tools to recognize and identify what you need, what that person needs and how y'all will be compatible together, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? If I need to observe how someone does con- how it handles conflict, we're going to go to an escape room on a first, second, third date. If I need to observe how someone handles children, and if they really truly, you know, adore children, I want to observe him in a in a setting where there's children, children that he don't know, because you don't know my kids. And if you're going to be around them, I want to see how you deal with um, uh, kids that are being kids. What's your patience look like? So I don't have to wait a whole year in before, you know, and after we go through all these family unions or whatever, to see how you deal with things. We can test each other right now. I'm up for testing. Like put the litmus test on me. I'm like, okay, that shows that you're interested in that you're being genuine in this connection. Cause I'm damn sure going to test you because I want to see how you are. So, um, yeah. I love it. That. Yeah, for sure. What are some things husbands can do to enrich their wives' life? Like, what can they, what can a, a husband do? Because we talked about how the pressure that a woman has uh, when she's married and kids and stuff. So, to the men who's watching or who will watch this, even in the comment section, I would like to hear from the ladies what what can what can men do better to to enhance your life. For me, it's this right here, giving me your undivided attention when I'm talking. Body, mind, spirit is focused on what I'm saying. Because oftentimes we are, women are the receptacles, we're the receivers of people's you know, stuff. And at the end of the day, I need someone who can make space for me. Who can protect me? I always tell uh, my friends when we're talking about femininity and, and masculinity is that the feminine is like the water and the masculine is like the container. Mm. We take on the form of anything that we um, surround or encompass or are or, or connected to. And that's for the whole world. That's for social media. That's for our kids. That's for our friends, our family members. But when I am around my man, or even when I'm not around him, I need to feel protected. I need to feel safe. I need to feel contained. And that's what the man provides for us. Safety is key. Security is key. Provision, that's all wrapped into just being there. And sometimes at the end of the day, when we go gossiping with our friends, talking with everybody and and pouring out to others, we just need someone to hold some space for us. And sometimes that just looks like being here and just 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 looking at us, giving us attention, paying attention to what we're saying and feeling it. Mm. That that's the first thing for me. If I have that, I can go rule the world. <laughs> I walk outside and still let us like I got 10 men behind me because I know that I'm safe. Mm. I can navigate this thing however I want to because I'm safe. Mm. But you just 
just be there. Yeah, that's good. Because I I've learned over time. Because sometimes you can be in the same room with someone and be in two different worlds. So mm-hmm. when I'm talking to my wife, and I had to learn this to get this really embedded in me, we can be in the same room, and I'll say, "Are you available?" And she's like, "No." And if she's not, that's cool. That lets me know it's not time for that. Wow. But if she's available, and I'm even teaching my kids that, my four-year-old, because he, mommy, 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 mommy. I said, Kayla, ask mommy, are you available? Yeah. And so he's getting used to that. So that way you know how to navigate. Because sometimes I think we get into conversations that you're kind of like not ready to have, but you're like, eh, let's kind of just get this out the way kind of thing, opposed to setting time for that. So asking that question and make your ears perk up and say, am I really ready for this conversation or whatever you want to talk about? And if you're not, it's okay. We can address it later. Yeah. So that's something I've learned over over time. Those things you can start in dating. Yes. You need to know a person. Um, I have one guy that I had been talking to over the phone and there's a lot of, and it's not to be arrogant or anything, but there's a lot of men who try to court me. But the one that stands, the ones that stand out are the ones who are respectful of my time. Mm -hmm. Texting me and asking me, are you available? May I call? What time are you? Because they understand that she is dating and she is making time for me, but she has other obligations that come before me. So if I really want to speak to her and have her undivided attention, I'm going to ask her when she's available. If I don't want to hear kids in the background, you know, she's just trying to hurry up and take my call so I won't have an attitude, I'm going to ask her when she's available. If I want to respect the fact that she is a businesswoman, she has a nine to five and she has children and a social life, I'm going to ask her when she's available because I'm interested in spending time with her and her alone. That says so much and it, and it prioritizes her, prioritizes you on her list. Because it says that you prioritize and respect her and yourself. So. Love that. I love that. So for those who are dating, because you, you, were, you were talking about the, talking about this, for the women, because I usually ask the men this when they're on the show. And then, you know, when it's the women, I ask them. So for women who are dating, they might be dating the same guy, just different faces. What do you think is the biggest mistake you see women make when it comes to dating? Um, not taking self inventory of themselves, um, going in and objectifying the man for a relationship. Um, I think it's important that you have a tribe of men, um, at, at your back, not your, well, you know, Mm -hmm. on your team as a woman, especially out here. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you go into dating, I call it the data gathering stage. This is not the stage where you romanticize the people that you connect with. You're connecting with everybody for a reason, but it's not always necessarily really the reason for romance. I've met plenty of men that are friends, platonic, or just associates or business. I have resources out the wazoo because I learned how to go into each connection with clear eyes, clear mind, and letting people be who they are. And oftentimes that turns out to be, you know, an, it's not a romantic connection and that is perfectly okay. But when we go in with the fantasy that, you know, he has the qualities that I want in a husband, we only looking at what we want and we miss out on the whole picture. We start fantasizing about what he could be. If we could change these little things and we can tweak a little bit of this or be a little bit more of that, then we can make him into the husband. We can mix and mold him into what we want. That wasn't never the purpose of the relationship. It was, you know, for business or whatever. So um, we can go in a bit more selflessly um, and and allow men to see what that connection is for. Because oftentimes, like I was saying before, we are the soft space for them. So when they want to talk and be transparent and vulnerable, they don't want to be met with, this is my ring size or this is the kind of house I want. They just want to talk to you about their day or what's going on. So you can be more available for that and not going in with selfish eyes and uh, and (laughs) thirst. (laughs) I know you you talked about this on Montoya's show, and I don't know if he actually heard, because I always ask my guests this. Uh, From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? 
Um, oh, Lord. My parents taught me a lot. The positive is that friendship um, is the firmest foundation that you can have in a relationship. Friendship builds, it, it, it sets the tone for everything else to build off of. I'm very big on that, all right? We can't do anything if we're not friends, genuine friends. Like you want to know the goofy side of me. You want to know the side of me that is still has insecurities or the side of me that loves to lay on the floor or go outside and lay in the grass. And you're not looking at me like I'm crazy. You know, that's the person that I would want to start that, that uh, journey with. Friendship is important. Um, also, that everything has an expiration date. Um, we grow and evolve through our relationships and sometimes we grow apart and it's okay to honor the expiration. It's okay to honor that we wanted two different paths. This was great. And I thank you for your time. I wish you the best in that journey that you're going. I'm going this way though. You go that way. It's all good. We ain't got no beef. Mm -hmm. Honor the expiration date and honor and, and be grateful for the time that you spent. Mm -hmm. Those are two most important things that they taught me through demonstration in their relationship. Mm, I love that. That's good. Because for some odd reason, we like to make every, like when relationships don't work, it's like, oh, they're the worst person in the world. It doesn't always have to end like that. No, it never has to end like that. Mm -hmm. It's cause and effect for everything. And I say, even in the demise of a relationship, there's always two people who played the part. There was some who, someone who did the action and someone who accepted the action. Mm -hmm. So we have to take accountability for both. Mm -hmm. um, and it may sound harsh because there are some, some extreme, you know, breakdowns in relationships, but nobody can do to you what you don't allow them to do. And I've been in some extreme relationships and there's always, always a way out. You just have to know that first. Mm -hmm. You have to make space for that knowledge first and that acceptance. Mm -hmm. I agree because even in my marriage and my first marriage, I always tell people how immature I was in my part that I played and my trauma was all over the place. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know I married at 24, but, and she had a 12 year old son. Like I was raising somebody half my age. Yeah. Wait. Which, which, which the, the funny thing about that is we were married for 15 years, divorced, but me and her son, we're still cool to this day. Me and him, we still have a good relationship. So I'm just happy for that because I've taught him how to drive. I taught him how to be a man and raise a family. So we're still good to this day. So um, I just wanted to throw that in there real quick because I, I, I take have, a that. I have I had a question. So how old was she when y'all married? She was 31. Okay. I was like, 12-year-old son and 24, cat. Yeah, right. Not that I look at it. Yeah, because she had him when she was like 18. Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so last question. And I ask, there's no right or wrong question. I always like to ask this. Is it easier to love yourself or love someone else? I love myself. It's easy to love myself. Um, I can't pour from an empty vessel. Um, I love myself exponentially and it allows me to love people without reason it's easier for me to love somebody than it is for me to like somebody like i can love anybody i think there's different levels of love mm -hmm. that uh, and i forget the the first level but it's a very basic love of love i love you because you exist i trust you because you this is what you show me to be i trust whatever you tell you show me to be and I love you because I can. It's very simple. I walk because I can. I breathe because I can. I love you because I can. And while the dynamic or the level of love may change, I love you because it's just that easy. I got it so you can get it. Now, when I get married, my, my he's going to get all levels of it. He's going to get all the overflow. I might be tired, but yeah. My kids, they get all of that. You know, my significant other will get all of that. But just people in general, I love people because we're different. And that that's the beautiful part of it. Mm, yes, I love it. 
Well, this has been a phenomenal episode. Oh my God, it's it's been an hour. Um, any any parting advice before we end today? Um, I employ and call people to have those conversations with themselves before they start dating, before they start looking into forming connections or intentionally forming connections with someone, have those conversations with yourself. Do desire pulls. Look in the mirror, center yourself, no distractions, and ask yourself, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what do I desire? Ask yourself that over and over again until you, until you start answering and you'll be surprised at what comes up, what emotions come up, what truth comes up. And at first, it's going to be those, those surface level things. I desire love. I desire to be protected. You got to go deeper. What does that mean? What is it that you didn't have or don't have that you desire that takes you to that level? What does love look like? So ask yourself the questions and mm. then go and find that within yourself first and then date. Mm, that's good. Well, I want to acknowledge you for uh, your boldness and your honesty um, and just for who you are, like, I haven't even met you in person, but your presence speaks power. So I want to acknowledge you for that. I want to acknowledge you for uh, doing this thing with social media. You just giving out so many gems out here helping folks because uh, I'm on your page. So I, I see what you're talking about a lot of times. And uh, I want to acknowledge you for being a single mom with five kids and, and, and being honest about, you know, your divorce and your relationships and just starting this thing back over again. So I want to acknowledge you for those things and continue to impact those. I know uh, I've checked out your content and I you've taught me some things. So I mm-hmm. want to acknowledge you for those things. Autumn, let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Um, So I'm all over social media on uh, Facebook. It's Autumn Sonata. The handle is the Autumn Sonata on Instagram is I am Autumn Sonata. Um, The book I'm working on is called Thank You Notes, how I moved from grief to gratitude. And I'm just um, detailing my lived experience from childhood on up to present time. So um, working on getting that sorted and organized so that we can get it released to the people. People have been telling me to tell my story for years. At first I was like, what story? I'm just living. <laughs> it's it's a story. So I'm, I fi- I'm finally telling it. Um, yeah. And uh, lo- be on the lookout for my, I'm starting my digital um, marketing firm called Fly Nerd. It's just going to be for Black creatives helping us out. It's going to be for us, by us. And so, um, yeah, there'll be apparel for that and the website and everything. So I'm out here. I'm out here doing my work. That's what's up. Well, I appreciate you and everything that you do out here in these social media streets and even in real life as well. So Brave Forest community, make sure that you go connect with Autumn. I will make sure I'll have all the information, everything linked up in the uh, notes and in the description and in the podcast and all other good stuff. If you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure that you share this podcast. Maybe you're not watching it. Maybe you have time just to listen. You're on the road. Make sure you share this with someone who are who's interested in this whole marriage thing and about men benefiting and how can women benefit. So make sure you do that. If you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button as well and share that with someone. This has been a great show. This is Sean Heineman with special guests. Autumn Sonata. All right, Brave Hearts community, take care.